I'm Shahar Razani, and in the news, the unrest in Iran continues. What does the future hold? The situation in Iran does not seem to subside, as news continues to trickle about prison riots, executions of youngsters who dare to rise against the regime and dream of a better future for themselves, as well as continuous indiscriminate firing at demonstrators, one that, according to various reports, results in the death and injury of hundreds of them, some very young. What should we expect from these important and disturbing developments? And is there hope for the Iranian people suffering under the hands of the Ayatollah regime? To learn more about what's happening on the ground in Iran and look into the implications for the present and for the future, I am pleased to have with us on JBS someone with great sources, resources, and knowledge of it all. My good friend, journalist, and activist of many years, Carmel Melamed. Carmel Melamed is an award-winning journalist, activist, and attorney based in Los Angeles. He was born in Iran and fled Iran at a young age after the revolution with his family to escape persecution from Iran's newly then established Islamic regime. As a journalist since the year 2000, Carmel has given a new voice to the successful Iranian communities living in the United States, as well as having covered issues relating to Iran and the Middle East for many years. Over the years, he has received numerous journalism awards for his excellence in news reporting, and his articles have appeared in a host of prominent online publications. Carmel, welcome. Chag Sameach. Happy Hanukkah to you and your family, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on JBS. Thank you, Shahar. It's a pleasure to be with you. Happy Hanukkah to you and, and the viewers. So first of all, let's dive straight in. What can you tell us about the status of the protest at the moment in Iran? And how come, the truth is, we're not hearing enough about it? Uh, the protests are still going on in all the major cities in Iran. It uh, began three months ago, and uh, it, it continues. Uh, they are typically younger uh, students between the ages of 15 and 25. They've taken to the streets. And they've said, we've had enough of this uh, radical totalitarian Islamic regime. We want our freedoms. And they're literally fighting with no weapons against the regime's thugs and goons that are killing them, uh, batoning them. Um, and literally, uh, they're, they're being slaughtered. You've had more than 500 people killed in the last three months. 500, you're saying five, more than 500 people. More than 500, yes. And 60, 60 plus are young children. I'm talking about age eight, nine, 10, and teenagers. And then over 15,000 that have been arrested, protesters, uh, just for going out in the streets and saying, we don't want this regime anymore. Uh, it's a horrific, horrific situation. Why the media isn't covering this in the U.S., I, I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know if it's because the current administration doesn't want to focus on some of the regime's human rights abuses because they still have hopes of some kind of nuclear deal or whether the media is just not interested. Uh, it's shameful. It's sad. Um, these are human beings. They're demanding freedom. And we in the West and Americans of freedom should be uh, shining a light on what's going on in Iran. Agreed. Uh, we are seeing, though, a prominence of, of the uh, Iranian protests on social media, aren't we? Uh, absolutely. Um, it, it's all over Twitter. Uh, there's a few social media outlets. Telegram is another one uh, where Iranians are uploading their videos, photographs. Um, showing what's happening to them. A lot of gruesome photos of uh, them being shot with shotgun pellets, uh, being beaten, uh, just really, really uh, brutal uh, behavior from the regime. Photos of the regime's thugs arresting people. Um, many videos of families, parents that are weeping, begging for the regime not to execute their children. Um, it, it's pouring out from Iran. They you show it. One, yeah. one of those moments when you really ask yourself, what's the purpose of, a, of an international community? But I'm happy we're shining a light on this issue right here on JBS. 
And I want to I wanna ask you, I mean, we're hearing a lot of terrible things about tortures and rapes of, of some of these you know, young women who go out to demonstrate. But we, and the truth is, we have heard about protests in Iran in the last decade or so. We've seen the Green Revolution in 09, some protests beyond. What makes this specific protest so different in your opinion, Carmel? Well, it's, uh, it's widespread, Shahar. Uh, it's not just uh, in a few cities. Uh, there are numerous Iranian uh, cities, villages, towns uh, from all facets of life, uh, young people, older people, uh, celebrities, well-known figures that in the past really didn't get into this political issue have arisen. And they've said, no, we don't want any more of this. This is a horrific regime. Um, a huge part of this has been women. Women have been driving this revolution full blast uh, because they've had enough of 43 years of being treated like second-class citizen, chattel, uh, being forced to wear head coverings, not having freedoms to express themselves, um, having to have permission from their husbands or male uh, figures in their family to travel. Uh, it's not what, you, what we've seen before. Nationwide strikes countless cities where union workers are striking. Uh, businesses are shutting down. They are so infuriated with the situation in Iran, um, the economic situation, that the country is really united in a very big way. And they're saying, we, we've had enough. So this is a very widespread and large, full-blown revolution that we haven't seen before. Right. Um, and that's also a message in and of itself. And at the same time, we were mentioning the mainstream media, we were mentioning the uh, social media, naturally your important work, because I can see that you continuously report about what, what's happening on the ground. And we've also seen a lot of messages of support coming towards those Iranian youth from many capitals in Europe. And I'm talking about the masses from um, the state of Israel itself, a lot of Israelis, and even in Los Angeles, we've seen pro-Iranian uh, protesters demonstrations on the street. Tell us a little bit about those demonstrations of support and how are they received in Iran? Uh, it's really remarkable. Um, we've had uh, Iranian uh, expatriates in Europe, uh, Australia, uh, obviously the United States, that have really taken to the streets uh, here in Los Angeles for the past three months, even sometimes during the week, we've had uh, thousands of uh, Iranian expatriates taken to the streets supporting the people of Iran saying, uh, we're behind you. Uh, we're raising our voices so the current administration, local state government will hear What's going on? Even though the media is not covering it, we're out there raising our voices in support of you in Iran. Um, those folks in Iran are loving it. They are getting tremendous amounts of encouragement. When they see that fellow Iranians outside of Iranians, Europeans and Americans are standing up and saying, we're supporting your fight for what you're going through encouraged by it and it continues do you um but is this enough carmel i mean all of these messages of support without concrete assistance the regime is a very um strong and resistant to these attempts for revolution and without any kind of significant assistance in the form of either sanctions or or any kind of support is this enough to propel a change in iran in your opinion uh, in a way, uh, it is not enough. We need diplomatic pressure. We need economic pressure from the U.S., from the Europeans, from many of the Asian countries that are buying oil and gas from the Iranian regime. Um, there needs to be a concerted world effort to help the people of Iran, not just rhetoric, uh, but real diplomatic economic pressure that will embolden the people and allow many of the forces in the country, not necessarily the revolutionary uh, guard 
team, but uh, uh, the army, it'll perhaps encourage them to side with the people and rise up and say, we've had enough, we're taking the country back. But there needs to be some kind of significant economic coming from the rest of the world. Right. Um, I want to ask you um, a specific question about the Jewish community. Have they been especially impacted by the recent riots? What's their situation at the moment? You're in touch with, um, with those people on the inside. What are you hearing? What's their situation now? Well, there, there's roughly 5,000 to 8,000 Jews still living in Iran. And the leadership right now is supporting the regime. And it's not because they necessarily support the regime. It's for their own survival. They know that if they don't publicly voice support for the regime, their lives and the lives of the rest of the Jews in Iran will be in uh, serious um, serious problems will, will arise for them. It, dire consequences will, will befall them if they don't. So they're, they're publicly voicing support for the regime, the leadership of the Jewish community, and they're trying to keep a low profile. They're encouraging young people, older people, not to get involved with the protests. They're telling them, you know, this is something that we don't want to get mixed up with. We're already under a tremendous amount of pressure from the regime uh, that's looking for an excuse to arrest Jews. So let's not say anything. Let's kind of keep a low profile. And they've released many statements since the protests began, condemning the protests and saying, we support the regime. Uh, they are rioters. They are criminals. And we don't, we don't back them. Uh, amidst all this activity, uh, Jews have been arrested. Uh, there were some reports of five Jews being arrested, and then they came back and said, no, there are three arrested. Recently, my most recent information that I've received is two of them have been released, and there's still one in jail. Um, it's, they're young people. They're a part of the rest of the Iranian young people's population. They've gone out, they were frustrated with the situation, and they protested along with the other Iranians. Uh, and, and they were unfortunately arrested. Thankfully, they've been released. Um, but the situation for the Jews in Iran is the same as it has been for the past 43 years. Uh, they, they are literally hostages of the regime. And they are basically playing Russian roulette with their lives. Well, in many ways, the, um, so many of the Iranian population is a hostage of this really horrible regime that's been... Uh, that has taken Absolutely. over Iran in the past few decades. Um, you're mentioning the prisons, and we're also hearing about all sorts of prison riots and uh, uprisings within the prison. What's the situation there? What brings about those riots? And and do they really have a chance of really shaking up the, the regime from within? Um, I don't have riots in the prisons. I know... Uh, there was there were some uprisings. There was a fire in Evin prison, which was one of the main uh, notorious prisons for the regime in uh, near Tehran. Um, there, you know, I'm sure there are figures that are um, upset, but the regime has has total uh, control. Total control within the prisons for now. You know, um, Carmel, you mentioned a few words about what's happening in the international community, and we have seen a little bit of tiny encouragement by Iran being thrown out of ECOSOC's UN Commission on the Status of Women. Um, membership, quite honestly, that's been dubious from the get-go. What do you think that means? And for me personally, it's always been an issue that Iran as a member state of the United Nations would continuously declare its desire to annihilate another member state of the UN, the state of Israel. But it seems that the international community can tolerate this. But finally, we're seeing the international community doing something about Iran. How encouraged are you about this? And what more do you expect to see from the international community in this regard and beyond? Would love your take on this. Uh, I, I think it's very promising. Uh, finally, we're having many countries in the world and at the UN uh, hearing the people's, uh, hearing the Iranian people's voices and saying, this is horrific. 
uh, what's the purpose of the UN if not to support human rights? And uh, bravely and rightly so, they are um, chastising the Iranian regime, the Ayatollah regime, and saying this is unacceptable. I think it's the beginning of, of great things that are happening at the UN. And it partly comes from a lot of Iranians that are living outside of Iran, that are pressuring many of these diplomats uh, in the European countries and elsewhere and saying, hey, you can't stay silent to uh, the brutality of the regime. So it, it's, it's people waking up around the world, but it's uh, to stand up and speak for the people of Iran at the UN. So there's encouragement coming from uh, outside forces on UN diplomats and some of the European countries to support Iranians. You know, it's uh, it's actually a great lead to my next point because we have seen uh, footage, a video that's been released of President Biden on a campaign trail approached by an anti-regime, as what seemed to be an anti-regime protester who came up to the president and mentioned that um, how much they're against the Mullah regime and how much uh, uh, how important it is not to sign the nuclear agreement with the uh, with the Iranian regime. And I, I want to ask you, aside from this being another a testament to what you're saying about the importance of standing up right here. Um, against the Iranian regime and show that support for the people of Iran to the elected officials and the administration. What do you think is the future of the, a nuclear agreement with Iran under the circumstances? I think it's dead. Uh, just as the president said uh, in, in his impromptu conversation with that uh, person in the crowd, the, the Iran deal is effectively dead. And it's not dead because of the Western powers not wanting to, and America not wanting to make the deal, it's dead because the regime has made it dead. They don't want to make a deal. There have been ample opportunities in the last two years to make a deal, but the regime doesn't want that deal. They keep adding new requirements and new things that they want and sanctions that they want removed. Uh, it's effectively dead. And also on a moral basis, it's dead because the people of Iran are crying out to the world. They're crying out to America and they're saying, how can you give billions of dollars to this brutal regime when they're slaughtering us in the streets? How can you give them an economic lifeline? So from a moral perspective, it's dead. From a diplomatic perspective, it's dead as well. Um, they just need... <laughs> to make it formalized and 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 read uh, uh, the death certificate of of this uh, quote unquote deal. You know, it's also important to mention that in the uh, general context, it's not just the kind of oppression that the regime is executing against its own people. It should also be reminded the negative role played by Iran in the Ukraine assisting Russia with their drones, attacking innocent civilians. We've heard only a couple of weeks ago about an innocent couple that got killed in their apartment as a result of such a homicide, suicide drone. What, what's your take on the Iranian involvement in the Ukraine with Russia? It's, it's horrific. It's just yet another example of this regime, a rogue regime that's running rampant uh, throughout the world. Uh, they spread their terrorism uh, through the Middle East primarily, but now we're seeing that they're spreading their terrorism uh, in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it's a runaway regime that has no problem supporting uh, war and terror and, and killings of innocents. Uh, it's sad that the Europeans and, and also the current administration hasn't tightened the screw. Uh, you'd think that the Europeans would stand up and say, hey, this is wrong. We should stop buying Iranian oil, Iranian gas, uh, and start sanctioning not just the regime, but all the IRGC and uh, the regime's companies and businesses uh, that have uh, arms deals or any kind of uh, support for the Russians. It's a, well, a very important point, Carmel, that they're vulnerable 
on that issue. And you're mentioning a, an extremely valid point that comes to mind in the context of the of any agreement with the regime when you're dealing with a nuclear issue, but it's really a majorly destabilizing force in the Middle East and beyond, sending its tentacles from the Houthis in Yemen to Syria, to Iraq, to Lebanon, to the Palestinian territories and beyond. Um, and in that sense, it's playing an extremely negative role on the on the world stage. So I want to ask you, almost as we are about to conclude our interview, a few words about the anti-Israel sentiment within Iran. How significant is it, and how has it changed over the years? Is it coming from the people, from the regime, from both? Because both of us would love to look at the uh, in the future, uh, into the future, with some hope. I think uh, the people, for sure, uh, have rejected the regime's forty-three year campaign of Jew hatred and Israel hatred. Uh, and we're seeing that in the streets when they're chanting slogans. They're saying, which means not Gaza, not Lebanon, which is Hezbollah. And my life is sacrificed for Iran. This is what they're chanting, which right. is a blatant rejection of the regime's indoctrination for the past 43 years to hate Israel and to hate Israelis. Uh, they're also tearing down street signs during their protests of Palestine Street um, and all of the regime's anti-Israel signage. Uh, they're saying, we don't have any problems with Israel. If anything, uh, we have friendships with them. We have ancient friendships. We have modern friendships with them before the, the revolution. So the people, the majority of the people, especially the younger people, have no anti-Israel sentiment. The regime, obviously, and the regime's loyalists, obviously, are still uh, vehemently anti-Semitic, vehemently anti-Israel. So uh, there's no change in that. But the people, for the most part, are very supportive of Israel. And I'm telling you, Shahar, you'll be very, very surprised when this regime collapses, you may see uh, a peace deal, a Cyrus Accord between Israel and Iran, the likes of which the world hasn't seen, and it will shock people. If the Abraham Accords shocked people, the Cyrus Accords, I think, will really surprise people because the, Iran the Iranians have always uh, had a strong bond with the times of Cyrus uh, all the way to the modern age uh, during the reign of the Shah. There were great relations between Israel and, and Iran. It doesn't... Carmel, from your mouth to God's ear, I think all of our viewers and everybody around the world is united in the hope of seeing the peace cycle expands, especially when it comes to Iran. And most of all, freedom to the people of Iran, freedom to the younger generation in Iran, freedom to the women in Iran. And I would love to, maybe since we are uh, really reaching the conclusion of our very short talk, I'd encourage all of our viewers to follow your reporting closely on your various outlets just to see what's happening and keep track and give voice to the people of Iran. But before you go, and knowing that you're fluent in Farsi, I would like you, I would like to ask you to use this platform to send a short message in Farsi to the brave people in Iran who are fighting for their lives as we speak, if you will, Carmel. Absolutely. Thank you, Shahar, for that uh, opportunity. درود بر شما هم نیهانان من در ایران من یک ایرانی یهودی که در ایران به دنیا اومدم و در سن دو سالگی اومدم بیرون حمایت میکنم از جنبش آزادی شما تمام پیام های شما رو در سوشال میدیا دیدم ویدیو رو دیدم و قلبم شکسته واسه سختی هایی که کشیدین از سرکوب این رژیم هدف من از یه خبرنگار ایرانی امریکایی این هستش که پیام شما رو برسونم به تموم شبکه های اخباری امریکا و سر تا سر جهان این جنبش آزادی مثل یه پرنده هستش که دو تا بال داره یه بالش شما ها هستین در داخل ایران یه بالش ماها هستیم ایرانیانی که خارج از ایران هستیم با همدیگه میتونیم پرواز کنیم به طرف آزادی امیدوارم روز پیروزیتون رو ببینم پاینده ایران
So my message, Shahar, to my compatriots in Iran was offering them my support as an Iranian Jewish reporter, as someone who was born in Iran and left at the age of two. Um, I offered them my support as a journalist to spread their message of uh, freedom. And this freedom movement that they have is like a bird that has two wings. One wing is those that are uh, in Iran and the other wing are those that are outside of Iran. The way that this bird will fly to freedom is if both wings um, work and, and fly to freedom together. That was my message. Well, that's an incredible message, Carmel. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank, thank you, you for, your, for your brave words and for your continuous work in journalism, activism, and beyond to make this world a better place and to reach out to the people of Iran and to seek justice, especially, I have to say, through such a moving message of friendship and hope coming from a Jew, from an Iranian-American Jew in their own language. Really much appreciated. Thank you, Carmel, for your time and for making us all wiser on such an important topic on the global stage. Thank you, Shankar, for having me, and thank you for JBS for uh, talking about this issue and raising awareness about the situation in Iran. We will continue to do so. And to all of our viewers, I'd like to say thank you for watching. Keep up with what's happening in Iran. Follow Carmel's reports. Stay safe, stay happy and healthy, and happy Hanukkah to all of you watching. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golov, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful producer of In The News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Azani. Until next time, see you soon. Shalom and later.